So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming out on a you know Friday evening, late afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, we figured we'd try something a little bit different uh, since many people are stuck inside uh, at these times anyway. So my name is Joe Emanuel Hall. I am an organizer and an educator with Labor Notes based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, many of you are probably already familiar with Labor Notes, but I'll give the little backstory in case you aren't. Labor Notes is a, a multimedia education project focused on trying to help build and facilitate and foster and coordinate uh, a militant wing of the labor movement of uh, getting people learning from one another about uh, struggles that they've been involved in, things that they're taking on. And so we put out a monthly magazine and have been doing so for 40 years. We uh, publish a lot of news material on our website. Um, and we also host educational events, both uh, ones like these that are panels, but we also do a lot of training and organizing training education um, and look forward to being able to do so in person with you all again. Our big flagship event is uh, every two years we do this big conference uh, in Chicago, just outside of Chicago, um, to, uh, that brings together thousands of rank and file staff officers from unions around the country and around the world to uh, learn from one another, teach one another, and just network in a way that we think is really important. Uh, so uh, without further ado or talking from me, um, I'm going to get started with this and pass it off to uh, the panelists. Just a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have questions for the panelists, the chat is going to be really difficult for me to follow doing all of these different things. Please use the Q&A. Uh, it's great to have people introducing themselves in uh, the chat and doing stuff like that. Um, I'm leaving it open here because I trust you all if, you know, I'll, I'll shut it down if I need to just because uh, I don't have the, the like wherewithal during all of this to actually moderate it. So um, with all of that being said, uh, we're gonna keep it to, uh, try to keep it to within an hour to respect everybody's time. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that we'll have a lot of good discussion in that time. So uh, without further ado, I wanna pass it off uh, first to our, our first panelist, uh, Kristen Perez, who is an RN and a unit steward with the Illinois Nurses Association at UIC Hospital in Chicago, um, and who's gonna tell us about a, a strike that she was involved in. And uh, then we're gonna go to our next panelist and then we're gonna keep going and have some back and forth discussion. So Kristen, thanks so much for coming. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm really happy to be here and talk to other people who are interested in labor action and um, furthering union causes, um, both in Chicago and across the country. Um, the way I found out about, um, you know, being on this panel is that I participate in a monthly um, group of people who um, are union members from different parts of the country, and we talk about different labor um, and union issues um, where we are locally. Um, and so I'm really glad to be able to have the same kind of discussion with a broader audience. Um, at, our, the strike that I participated in specifically um, just happened uh, this past September. Um, and uh, it stemmed from a, an expired contract that expired in August of last year um, with uh, a very contentious uh, negotiation process with our um, hospital administrators. It was really going nowhere. And, um, you know, they just gave us no choice um, in the matter but to strike we had a resounding um, strike vote that was, um, I wanna say more than 99% of our membership voted to strike. Um, and uh, administration still did not uh, take that as we were serious and, um, and we did have to go out on strike and we went out for seven days. Um, the great thing about it is that uh, the other labor union that exists within our hospital other than INA is, um, SCI, uh, SEIU and they are um, the overwhelming majority of uh, union membership in our hospital. Um, I think they have over 5,000 
members, um, whereas INA uh, is something like uh, a thousand nurses. So the, the two unions together uh, coordinated about uh, strike dates and we didn't go out on the same day, but we went out um, each union within, I think uh, INA went out on a Friday and SEIU followed us out on the following Monday. So there was um, upwards of five, 6,000 people outside of the hospital who are usually inside the hospital working. And so those numbers um, outside the hospital really sent a message, not only to the administrators, but to um, the public of what the issues were um, and that it wasn't just something trivial. Um, it was more than just uh, nurses wanting a raise, um, which is what the hospital likes to um, you know, uh, portray it to be, but we were really fighting for really important safety issues, not only for nurses in asking for um, appropriate and adequate PPE, um, but also asking for um, safe patient ratios to protect the people we take care of. There's no point in trying to save lives if we're doing a bad job of it. Um, and so we were asking for safe patient ratios. We were asking for adequate um, PPE supply and we were asking for a nominal raise were our three uh, main requests. Um, and so after the seven days, we did go back in and uh, the hospital did finally um, negotiate in good faith with us and our executive board did a fantastic job negotiating on nurses behalf and anything that uh, was questionable that they were offering, they brought it to us. And when we said no, they said, great, we're gonna go back and fight for you. And my goodness, they won, we won. And it felt so good because there was 6,000 of us outside saying like, this is wrong. This is not the situation workers should be working in. Um, and the hospital just could not say no in the end. And so both unions went back in, um, were able to negotiate fair contracts. Um, and for the most part, we uh, achieved everything we asked for, um, which was, uh, a huge thing and now uh, UIC is the only hospital in the state that has something close to safe patient ratios. So that's a huge deal. Absolutely, thank you, Kristen. That is uh, super inspiring and a huge win. And I, I already have some some questions, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold my tongue for now and we're, we're gonna come back in discussion. We'll, we'll get to it. So I wanted to introduce uh, Next, uh, John Pearson, who is an ER nurse um, and is the Alameda Health System chapter president for uh, SEIU Local 1021. Um, and so, uh, hit us, go, go with it. Tell us about the, your, your action. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, it's hard to follow what uh, Kristen just told us about. And actually, um, it's really cool to be here with Kristen because Kristen, you might not know it, but um, you and your coworkers blazed the way for us uh, because our strike was about a month later. And um, my coworkers and I were all following as much news as we could find about your strike. Um, and in a lot of ways, there are, there are similarities. Um, we're also uh, employees of a public hospital and clinic system um, that you know is is run kind of with this uh, you know basically kind of regime of austerity, like cutting public services. Um, and uh, multiple unions uh, were involved as well in the fight. And, um, and you know, it's something that's kind of unusual in healthcare, it's at least it's not the norm, is that nurses uh, were together with other people that aren't nurses um, in the strike and the buildup. Um, so just to give people context, I'm a nurse at a big public county hospital, Highland Hospital, and uh, that's part of our county hospital system. Our, our part of SEIU Local 10 to 1 uh, is called AHS Chapter. That's the name of our employer, Alameda Health System, or AHS. And um, it's, it's basically like, you know, over, uh, I think over 200 different job classifications, pretty much everybody that works in the hospitals and clinics in our county, the public ones, um, everybody from, you know, uh, clerical workers who answer phones and, and write things down, to um, people that do complicated procedures like nurse anesthetists, to food service workers who, uh, you know, that includes prep professional chefs and people that serve food and deliver it to patients. 
to housekeeping workers trained to keep levels of infection down uh, to, you know, of course, nurses and nurses aides and hundreds of others. Um, there's about 3000 of us. Uh, our strike and the buildup and the whole campaign also involved uh, CNA, which is a, a union that's only RNs. Um, and basically, uh, you know, to try to give you the short version of it, um, just like probably many of you are familiar, public services for decades have been um, under a regime of cutting and cutting and cutting and handing over lots of the things that used to be only public services to the private sector. So what does that really mean? It means like the county agreeing to get rid of public sector jobs that have good benefits and security and all that and just turn them over to private contractors. So our hospital system, for example, would take something like uh, the dialysis department, nurses that dialyze patients and all the support staff that goes into that and just get rid, lay off all those positions that have pensions, benefits, and job security and union rights, and then just get a contract with a private sector company and bring in non-union workers. Um, that's just one facet of, of uh, you know, kind of the work environment that we're in. Um, the other part of it is that our work day and the way that our patients get treated um, is, is pretty horrible, right? The conditions that we're working in are really bad. Um, so what does that mean for patients on the ground uh, where I work in the ER? That means that if you come in to see the doctor and have a real emergency that, you know, that you're very, very sick, you might end up waiting six, eight hours just to get in a bed and see the doc be seen by a doctor. Even if you're really sick sometimes, um, when you're in that bed, you might be stuck there with no windows, lights on 24 hours a day, constant noise for days at a time in the ER, no guaranteed meal service. Many of the things that the doctors taking care of you are ordering aren't done because we're not able to do them in an ER. And, you know, kind of on and on, just like this, that's the conditions we're working under. Uh, so our employer uh, at the beginning of bargaining back, um, you know, way over a year ago, when our contract, before our contract expired in March of uh, 2020, uh, basically went on a rampage trying to tear up the contract um, and rewrite uh, large sections of the contract, probably more than half of the whole contract. Um, a real sort of scorched earth approach that we don't usually see in the public sector. Um, so kind of union busting. At the beginning of our campaign, we sat down and figured out, you know, what do we want? What are our members telling us on this contract survey that we did what they want? And we realized that to get anything that our members wanted or to fix any of the problems, we were gonna have to basically force the county to come in and remove the leadership and reverse this kind of privatizing direction. Um, and uh, to all of our surprise, we pulled it off because we built up to what ended up being a strike in the middle of the pandemic um, and forced the county to come in, get rid of our entire board of trustees uh, in a very dramatic public meeting. Uh, and the, the new trustees are now very busy pushing out the executives who've been doing all this to us. Um, and so, you know, it's going to be a continued fight to finish our contract. Uh, bargaining has totally turned around, but we have to we have to close the contract. And it's good. It looks like it's going to be a, a fight to get the county to actually um, follow through on what they promised to do because they're backpedaling now. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we did. Um, we went on strike in the middle of the pandemic and got the got what was basically a privatizing public service to reverse and come back into the county. Apologize, I covered up my unmute button with a different screen. Uh, also, a very inspiring, great story. And now I'm uh, I'm looking forward to to digging in a little bit to to both of the examples. And if uh, along the way either of you have questions that you want to ask each other, please uh, interrupt me because those are really cool too. Um, so, uh, Kristen, I wanted to ask a little bit about. Um, you know, John started to talk about the the some of the structures that they had to build up, some of the work that they did in the lead up to the strike. Could you talk a little bit about what that looked like in your unit and uh, with your coworkers of uh, trying to build up support for the strike? What were the conversations like? What were the challenges to doing so? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't hard to drum up support amongst the union members. We were all just have had enough um you know our administrators um are uh so 
heinously terrible to us in some ways. And um, the pandemic uh, gave them a huge opportunity to correct some of those actions. And they totally took the opportunity to do the opposite. Um, you know, so uh, during the pandemic, one floor was, um, you know, designated as the, the COVID floor outside of the ICU and those nurses um, worked so hard and every nurse in the hospital had worked so hard, every staff person, um, you know, was really just doing everything they could in the name of helping people who were sick. Meanwhile, so many of us became sick, um, some in very serious and dire ways. Um, and we had a total of, um, I believe four staff members who passed away, two nurses and two non-nurses during the pandemic due to COVID. Um, and I wanna say that uh, generally those, those staff members did not work in the COVID areas um, and did not generally have um, a lot of comorbidities. Um, so they were very shocking and um, very painful for our staff. And so on top of the, the bad behavior from our administrators before the pandemic and then with the pandemic and being asked to reuse our PPE um, up to six times with an unknown sterilization process um, and then you know re-wearing those masks and receiving emails about how not enough of us are recycling and reusing our masks and um, and then uh, just, you know, like the, just the general disrespect from our administrators. Um, it was easy to say enough is enough. And it's, and it's time for us to say like, we're gonna go stand outside now. Um, when, by the time it came to the vote in um, August, administrators had done very little negotiating. The kinds of things that they were asking to change in the contract it was basically as if they had um, torn up the co previous contract and started over and they were just asking for ridiculous things, something like uh, 150 hours or, so, or something like that of um, mandatory low census time and um, you know changing floating tracks and uh, raises that are only based on patient outcomes that are actually impossible to get um, with the staffing ratios we had in the first place. Um, and nurses were just tired. And, um, and every staff person in the hospital had had enough. And so we all, uh, you know, on, on that Friday, we wa walked out of that hospital and we stood outside for seven days as brothers and sisters shouting at the top of our lungs and telling anyone who would listen what we were asking for and why those things were important for not only, um, you know, to make the hospital a better place, but to keep those patients that are inside safe. Um, because that's, that's why we all get up and go to work in that hospital every day anyway. And so what are we doing if we're not asking for the safety of those people? Um, and in turn, um, gaining safety for ourselves as workers. Um, so it was, you know, like the, the 6,000 people standing outside shouting and telling the administrators what a terrible job they've done um, was really powerful. And a lot of people, it seemed like stood up and listened and there was so much support from outside. Um, you know, their Teamsters uh, stopped delivering to the, to the hospital and to the nearby construction site for which they're building our new surgery center. Um, other, um, labor groups came and supported um, with people and signs every single day. Um, some of the nurses down the street from Cook County who are from uh, National Nurses United came and visited every day. Um, uh, Chicago Teachers Union members also came. And it was so great to have that um, visual and verbal support from them um, because that, those seven days were long and sometimes it was raining and cold. Um, but everyone's energy and uh, passion for fighting what, for what is fair and for what was safe for our patients was paramount and everyone stayed together and it just looked like such a strong, um, like massive movement outside the hospital. And we even took it marching, um, you know, around the radius of the campus 
down to the chancellor of the university's home, um, which is not a short walk. Um, they blocked, I wanna say, um, the bridge crossing Ashland going towards the chancellor's home. Um, and it, you know, people in the city had to say like, gosh, why, they, there must be something wrong going on if all these people are out here doing this. Um, and in the end, both unions were successful in um, getting what we were asking for. And it was, you know, a historic ask because we got a commitment for the hiring of uh, an additional 200 nurses in the hospital. Um, and I think their deadline is this coming June. Um, and that once we have those additional um, staff, we will have um, a commitment for uh, ratios that are actually safe in the hospital where nurses can practice safely and patients are going to have the best possible outcomes. Thank you. And uh, John, I wanted to ask you the same question um, about in uh, in the the build up to the strike, how what did uh, what did that organizing look like? Uh, what were the challenges that you faced? Um, how did you build out the the networks and structures that you needed, and what types of networks and structures did you need uh, to be able to wage a successful strike? Yeah, we we really kind of had to roll with the punches and um, and come up with. Uh, you know, like with plans on the fly at times, um, especially because of the pandemic, that really changed a lot of things for us. And in a few ways, I think it actually, um, I, I don't wanna say it helped us because it gave us some huge challenges. You know, like for instance, I think it's much easier to have a strike um, when you can have more in-person meetings. And so it was really hard to build up enthusiasm over Zoom. Um, <laughs> But you know the the preparation. I think a lot more went into it than it might have looked on the surface to a lot of our members and uh, to the public. Um, we started talking about a strike, the possibility we might have to go on strike, um, and then the you know, potential need for a strike, and then planning for how we might do it um, two years in advance. Um, and the first thing that we did when we started saying, you know, like, look, we've got to consider all the tools that we have in our toolbox and. The, probably the strongest one that we might have to resort to if things get really bad is a strike. And um, the way that we kind of like ended up planning this out, and you know, it didn't go perfectly, there were hiccups, but um, we started by um, working on a contract survey. And so we kind of like crowdsourced from as many different crowds as we could at work, um, questions and issues to put on a contract survey to see what our coworkers cared about. Um, we had a goal of a percentage of how many surveys we were gonna get back. I think it was somewhere around uh, like 70% of the membership. Um, and we didn't quite reach that goal, but we got over half of our members surveyed, I believe. Um, and then that became um, the basis for what the bargaining team decided were their priorities. And one of the reasons that that was really helpful is that um, in the past, our experience has been when bargaining teams come in cold, um, most people in their normal lives don't really have a sense of um, having to represent lots of other people. This is a kind of unusual thing to have to do. Um, and so if you're just kind of coming in cold, mostly you're just gonna refer to like your circle of friends and your own personal experience and not what lots of people want, right? And we're representing 3000 people working in this big hospital system. And so that kind of set limits, you know, based on what the majority of our members really cared about, wanted. Um, and we were able to use it to justify what our priorities were in bargaining. Um, it also, um, I think that was actually even a secondary purpose. The main purpose really was just to have uh, the survey as a vehicle for having one-on-one -on -one conversations with lots of people. And so that kind of like started people thinking about talking about just being aware of the fact that like, we're going to bargaining. What does that mean for me? And what's my role in it? Even if I'm not somebody that's gonna sit at the table, like what, what are the possible outcomes? And then what role can I play to get you know, what my coworkers and I might need or want. Um, and I think that was one of the most helpful ways to think through every other part of the campaign is like, uh, what, out of what we're planning, what is the, the right vehicle to use to have lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations and get people engaged in a way that feels um, uh, really connected to things that they care about, uh, to their own interests. 
Um, and how do we tie that to things that we need to be fighting about that are about patient care? Um, so after that happened, um, there were several other uh, vehicles, including things like you know giving bargaining updates, um, having the election for the bargaining team uh, before that. Um, and then uh, in the ramp up to the actual strike, as we we're escalating, um, we had, this is right before the pandemic, um, escalating actions at different campuses to put pressure on management, uh, press conferences, then the pandemic hit, we had more press conferences because we got tons of media attention during the beginning of COVID. Um, and then uh, finally, a couple things like petitions to get buy-in around you know, the county taking over and to put pressure on the county. Um, and then uh, we had a strike vote very dramatically and kind of out in the open very visibly so that management would see us, see members like, you know, coming off of their floor and wearing purple and all putting a ballot in a box and, you know, a big sign that said strike vote. Um, and so all those kinds of things uh, really went into the buildup. Um, and then, uh, you know, just to talk about some of the things that were challenging um, that we had to roll with the punches, uh, like with COVID, um, one of the hardest ones to deal with was the fact that we couldn't have in-person meetings um, very easily. Uh, and so we ended up you know, doing lots of workarounds, having online meetings, having conference calls, but also um, you know, many of us are working together shoulder to shoulder every day, no matter what, because we still have to take care of patients in the pandemic. And so some of us would just go from uh, floor to floor and talk to people and we just pull people into an open space, stand as far away from each other as we could and just have quick impromptu meetings or talk one-on-one. -on -one. And we did that very methodically and kept a list of all of our members and made sure that we'd had multiple one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with everybody by the point we got to talking about strike. Thank you both. Um, so one uh, set of questions that I've gotten a, a couple of questions about um, and that you've both mentioned in different ways. Um, you in both of the strikes that you were involved in involved uh more than one union uh striking at the same time striking together um in workplaces that are represented by multiple unions what was uh you know either of you wants to speak up to this first and I hope that both of you will uh what was the 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 role of that how important was that to the the strike and uh, how, what sort of takeaways did you have from it? Uh, challenges about making that work, uh, promise for future work, things like that. Um, I can take that. So, um, you know, the fact that we have the two unions within the hospital and one union represents such a large majority of the staff um, and that both of both unions chose to go out um, on strike at essentially the same time. Um, you know, it really showed that unanimously across the hospital, every single staff member was unhappy um, and felt that we were being treated unfairly and we were. Um, and so the fact that 6,000 people were like, hey, this is not cool and we need to stand up for this and walk out of our jobs was um, a huge message to um, not only our administrators, but um, but the city and um, the state because it is a state run facility. Um, and we um, had so much support from outside unions um, who came to speak up on our behalf and other political figures who came to speak up on our behalf and say like, hey, these people are not asking for something crazy. Um, what they're asking for is something that will benefit the patients. And that's like the most important thing. So um, the fact that um, not only strategically, but symbolically a CIU walked out of their jobs with along with the INA was so powerful and showed so much solidarity and strength uh, between the two unions and so much commitment because it wasn't easy. And, you know, um, this was the first time that the nurses have walked out in an actual strike since the inception of INA at, um, 
at UIH. And so I want to say that's something like 47 years. So that it was the very first actual strike in um, since its inception. Um, and in the past, they had al always been able to resolve whatever um, contract issues there were before having to actually res um, you know, actually walk out. And this was the first time and so many nurses were like, oh my God, what are, are we really gonna go on strike? Like, what is it gonna look like? No one had any experience in that. Um, but everyone just put their bravest foot forward and stood up for what was right instead of what was easy. Um, it was easy to just give in to whatever um, the hospital administrator's demands were. Um, and it was, it was tough to stand outside and like make yourself a target to administrators as well. And um, the fact that resoundingly, the, you know, the, you know, every, every member of each union really did that. And um, there was so much more safety and strength in our numbers because of that. And then just the fact that Teamsters and all the other unions in the city came to stand beside us or took action along with us to help our cause really made it, um, made it an obvious choice that it eventually administrators had to give in. Um, and we did do um, our fair share, share of appealing to media and to, um, to the governor himself as he does sit on the board of our hospital. Um, and, uh, and to the, you know, we tried to go above, uh, you know, even just the CMO of our hospital and, and go uh, up to the union chancellor and, and whatnot to ask for these things because we weren't asking for something crazy. And we just wanted to get what was fair and due to our members who work so hard and sacrifice so much during the pandemic. Um, and so that solidarity meant everything, um, even in just giving everyone motivation um, to keep showing up and keep standing up and keep shouting at the top of our lungs, even though you had no voice anymore. And, um, and honestly, we had a great time. It was a fun time. And I never felt more supported or and more close to my um, fellow union members and not just other nurses, but just everyone in the hospital. Um, I'm a float nurse in the hospital. And so I go to all the inpatient non-ICU units. Um, and so I know quite a, you know, like I'm a familiar face to a lot of people. And so it was great to just like spend time outside the hospital with them and build our relationships and support each other. And like, you already know that you can count on those people inside the hospital, but then you learn that you can count on them outside the hospital too. And it felt so good. And it, and it just made it that much easier to take the risk and to lose the seven days worth of pay. And like, I could care less because everything we built together um, and knowing that we could be successful and then feel like if it were to come to this in the future, to know we've already done it once. It was great. Yeah, John, I'm interested to hear from you as well about the the multiple union dynamic um, and any, uh, you know, the, the promise and challenges of, of it, if there were any. Sure. Um, yeah, so we uh, had pretty centrally involved in our campaign and strike um, California Nurses Association. They have uh, some of the RNs, um, not the majority of RNs. Those are, those are myself and my coworkers, but um, at two of our hospitals, they represent the, uh, some of the RNs, um, a few hundred. Um, and they were, you know, we basically did a lot of coalition work, work with them, not around the bargaining so much. Um, they basically got stuck in the same kind of position with the employer and bargaining, but took a slightly different path to fight it. Um, but we did a lot of coalition work around the county taking over and just kind of like pushing back really hard at the scorched earth bargaining um, approach. And um, we coordinated our strike dates and our strike votes, and we're able to work pretty closely with them around, you know, picket lines and um, many of the escalating events like rallies and press conferences that we um, had in the buildup. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the Labor Council 
um, was extremely helpful. We got the la Labor Council, you know, we get, kept giving them updates as the campaign was progressing in the build up to a strike to get some buy in um, and then got sanctioned from them. And the uh, secretary treasurer of the Labor Council basically was like our kind of liaison or facilitator when we would meet with the politicians, the county supervisors um, who we were putting pressure on to take over or to intervene. Um, and that was that's been extremely helpful. They've continued to to play that role um, as we're trying to finish up bargaining, um, and as we're also meeting with these new trustees, like to put pressure on them to be accountable. Um, there also were some really wonderful moments during the strike where we got great support. Um, you know, like memorable things were that we found out that the garbage truck uh, drivers that pick up hospital garbage are teamsters, and you know somebody is like somebody's spouse uh, was one of those drivers. And they got the word out to their uh, union leadership and told us at the very last minute they're going to refuse to cross our picket lines and not pick up the hospital garbage. And so there are these great moments where, you know, you have like a garbage truck driving up, seeing a picket line, honking their horn and then driving away. Um, There's one truck driver, I guess, who got upset, crossed the picket line and then got sent back as a penalty by his fellow union members to walk the picket line with us as a penance. That was really cool. Um, and then the Teamster, one of the Teamsters locals also sent a giant Teamster semi truck to like do circles around our biggest hospital and blast the air horn over and over. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Um, we had so many other uh, unions send crowds of people in support and to be on the picket line with us. Fight for 15 workers. That was really cool. A group of, uh, of women who have been involved in lots of Fight for 15 action over the years came and we had this great interaction where they said, how are you guys feeling? And um, and I I said, gosh, you know, like a lot of us haven't done this before. We're really scared. Um, but I, you know, like, and I was just thinking in my head, they're not in a union. They're that's the fight for 15 campaign. They're way more vulnerable than we are. We already have a union. Like, you know, they they probably would be even more scared to go on strike. And they were like, yeah, you don't need to be scared. We've been in lots of strikes, and you should also consider marching to Sacramento for your demands. And we were like, oh, you're way more hardcore than we are. Uh, so yeah, there were lots of great moments, I think, of cross-union collaboration and solidarity. That's fantastic. Thank you both. Um, there, we've gotten a, a few questions, and I'm, I'm interested in myself in um, the the community support and, and public response aspects of um, how, uh, if you were able to build a, what you think was a effective community support in the strike, uh, what were some of the things that went into that and maybe some of the lessons to take away from that? And then also just sort of generally, what was the, the public response and the public perception of the strike? Um, I think we used a lot of different um, tactics to reach out to the public and garner support for um, for the strike. You know, prior to um, the INA uh, coordinated a candlelight vigil for those staff members that we lost to COVID um, in front of the hospital to just um, bring awareness to the to the plight that we were going through um, at the time and currently, and um, and there was plenty of news coverage there. Um, during, you know, during the strike, again, like lots of um, local news stations came um, and not only did they talk to e-board members who represent us so well and have all the right things to say when it comes to the media, but they also talked to the rank and file members, um, including, um, you know, uh, those who um, who represent our black and brown communities who are a majority of the staff in our hospital. Um, and, uh, you know, like asking nurses who speak Spanish to represent the group and talk, um, you know, to the Spanish uh, language networks and asking, um, you know, nurses from both inpatient and outpatient perspectives, what are they going through and why did they choose to strike? Um, and every member being, um, you know, well versed in what we were asking for and um, ready and willing to um, speak to any news outlet, uh, anyone who stopped them to, to give their perspective. Um, 
so I saw, you know, that happen over and over um, to independent um, news sources and papers and, um, you know, the public networks that, uh, that were coming to um, give us press coverage. And you would see the same um, repeat networks over and over covering us each day. Um, and then the, the political support that um, we had um, on each rally day, uh, most notably Jesse Jackson, who came and marched with us and actually, you know, like held hands with our INA president and walked, you know, the perimeter of the campus um, marching with us. Um, and uh, Chewy Garcia, several other state um, representatives, um, other representatives who were previously sponsoring um, our safe patient limits bill that did not pass last session, um, but will hopefully be reintroduced or will be reintroduced um, coming up this session and hopefully uh, with more success um, to garner uh, safe patient ratios, um, not only uh, in our hospital, but for the entire state of Illinois, which would be, you know, like uh, California level, amazing. Um, and um, just using every opportunity to, to give our, um, our version of what was going on and um, what we were going through and why we were asking for those things that were so not out of this world, they were completely reasonable things and backed by evidence, um, you know, safe patient ratios and, um, you know, and staffing limits are, are totally supported by evidence. Um, and there was a huge study that was, that came out even in um, sometime around the time of the strike that, you know, really supported what we were asking for. And so like people could see the logic and the science behind what we were asking for, not just that nurses are tired and don't wanna you know, help you to the bathroom. Like it, that's never the case. Um, so there was so, so many angles from which we could show like from our human angle, from an evidence-based angle um, and from a solidarity angle, you know, um, some of the SEIU uh, members even though Cook County has a $13 minimum wage, we're not even receiving the Cook County minimum wage because the hospital claimed it was a state hospital and was not was exempt from that. Um, and so winning the $15 minimum wage for SEIU members was a huge thing. Um, and you know, like if I don't, if my, you know, compatriots in SEIU don't win, then I don't win either. Because if they're working in an unsafe and unfair environment, then it's it's only a matter of time before it's unsafe for me. And so it was so great to see their success, um, because you know, like people need a, a fair wage, and especially with a majority black and brown uh, membership, like it's you know, racism is a healthcare crisis. And so we wanted to show to the public and, you know, set an example that like at UIC, we care about those things and we're not gonna let anyone uh, get away with that, whether the governor's on the board or not. Um, and it seemed like uh, based on, you know, all those things combined, they could, just couldn't say no in the end. Thank you so much. Um, John, I wanted to say, again, ask you the same question, this about uh, community support, how did you build it, um, how important was it, and what sort of was the, the public response, if you could articulate what it was? That's something that we struggled with at the beginning because we were using as an example for, you know, how do we carry out a successful strike, lots of the teacher strikes. And I think, you know, a key difference that we realized quickly is that teachers, um, you know, uh, have kind of a, a ready-made uh, constituency of public groups, right? So like in the elementary schools, you have your parent teacher associations or groups, uh, whatever they're called. And then in the high schools, we saw lots of groups of high school students who are, you know, together all day in class or, you know, socializing after school, um, supporting the teachers and the teachers interacting with those groups, you know, to collaborate about demands or those groups kind of pushing the teachers we don't have organized groups of patients like that. And many of the privacy rules that we have to work under really don't allow you know, us to facilitate or even really talk about 
um, things that could help that happen. And so um, I think we, you know, we really struggled um, to build community support. Some of the ways that it it was facilitated were um, uh, in some of the in, you know initial response to the pandemic. Um, we had a huge surge of media uh, interest and public interest in you know, just what's happening inside of hospitals at the beginning of the pandemic, and we were able to use that uh, you know to fight with the employer in public about uh, providing safe conditions for patients and for workers, um, and to have kind of these uh, fights similar to what Kristen was talking about over just providing us with the right equipment to do the job, to be safe, and to keep patients safe. And that sort of set the tone for the strike. Um, and through that, there were people, um, you know, like my coworkers in the ER doing big fundraisers. We collaborated with some doctors and we put the hospital kind of in the hot seat about not providing um, some basic equipment that they were required to provide. We fundraised and bought it on our own kind of to scold them in public about it and to shame them. And we got tons of interviews and lots of attention and raised money. Um, we used that experience to help uh, build a, like a strike relief fund which um, our union uh, has a structure set up kind of like that, but it's very clunky and it hasn't been used, I think, in quite a while in any very effective way. We wanted it to be kind of like, you know, ammo uh, so that people feel like they've got backup and security. And so we can kind of wave it in the face of the employer. Look how much money we've, you know, our members have raised. We can go on strike as long as you want, you know, that sort of idea. Um, uh, we also had um, some organized groups helping us in our coalition. We got tons of them signed on to support our demand to get the county to take over. That helped us get more politicians uh, to, to support that demand and sign on to our, um, you know, our, our letter asking the county to take over. Um, so you know, those are just some of the ways. I think we, we also, um, you know, probably like lots of other people in healthcare, saw lots of public support in the form of like sending food and donations at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and we were able to use some of those connections to get people to come to the picket line or to organize groups of their friends, family members, or coworkers to come and, and support us during the strike. Great, thank you. I wanted to give uh, either of you the opportunity to ask any questions that you have of one another uh, but now that you've heard a little bit more about what's been going on. Um, I've, I've got some questions at the ready too, but I, I I think that you might have some things to say. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious for Kristen, what has changed in your workplace uh, since everybody's had this experience of going through the strike? Yeah, I mean, slow is always, uh, uh, change is always slow, but um, you know, it's our duty as union members to make sure that it's at least steady. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely uh, some things that administration has done to um, delay um, the changes that they've agreed to or um, um, or or sabotage um, but our our union membership is so um, vigilant and they you know really are great about reporting problems or delays or um, asking why hasn't this happened yet um, and so there's quite a few people who are very brave to always speak up um, and, and question the administration on what they're doing. Um, but most notably, I've seen that um, staffing ratios are improving. Um, as a floater in the hospital, I know what it's like on a lot of different units. And so um, I just mentioned to the charge nurse on one floor um, the other day, I said, wow, you know, usually I really hate coming here, but it, this is much better than usual. <laughs> and she said, yeah, they have been trying to staff us a little better. So, um, so there, there was some, it was palpable change for me anyway, because it's usually a horrible place to work on that floor. Um, so it was like, I could just feel a, a small shift. Um, and there's more to come because they have, they still have 200 people to hire. And once we have those, you know, those extra staff, that's, um, we also had the, the administration also agreed to give control of deciding where those staff go where they're needed um, to um, the nurse care committee, which is run by our nurses and our rank and file union members. So the control is really in our hands of, um, of where those nurses go and where they're needed. Um, 
so that uh, you know it's it's evenly distributed throughout the hospital, both inpatient and outpatient sides, um, and uh, you know throughout um, critical care, med surge, and um, surgical areas, as well as like peds and whatnot. So, um, you know, the fact that the control still lies with us, it's not just the administration going, okay, here's here's ten nurses, and they're only all going to the transplant ICU. Um, which is a high gross um, money making area for them. Um, so, you know, it, it will be fair and, um, and uh, controlled by nurses so that uh, everyone's happy with the outcome of the additional staff. Um, so I think, yeah, there is definitely change, um, but, but slow. Um, in, in fact, the administration is attempting to delay the contract raises that we've um, won for ourselves. But of course, um, you know, an, an open mouth never, or a closed mouth never gets fed. So everybody's mouth is open. And um, at the very least, these administrators are uh, hearing in their sleep our constant complaints and emails and calls about um, where our money is. So it's coming. Oh, and we do have adequate PPE. They've committed to the PPE. They send us a report of what is in stock and what is at the level of par that they've agreed to. Um, and so there's definitely accountability um, because we're receiving that data from them, I think on a weekly basis. That's great. That's really cool uh, that you're striked at all that. I think that's that's really admirable and awesome, and and you should be you should be feeling it, <laughs> you should be feeling <laughs> feeling it, owning it. I like it. So on your end, John, um, uh, have you you guys have not yet reached like a final agreement, or are you guys just waiting on signatures for your contract? No, we're still bargaining. Um, oh. It's very frustrating. Uh, I you know I think. Uh, for the majority of, of members, right? Most of them are not directly engaged in the bargaining process at all. Most of them don't have somebody on the bargaining team that's right in their department that they can talk to. And so it's been frustrating for us because, um, you know, like you really want, like you want people to have a sense what they did had a big effect. Um, there was a very, very dramatic, um, you know, very public um, change where the county had their uh, board of Supervisors meeting, you know, the, the supervisors are the five elected officials that run the whole county and ultimately fund and are responsible for the hospital system, but have been kind of hands off for a long time. Um, they turned it into a separate kind of public entity called the Public Hospital Authority, sort of semi privatized, like to get around a lot of the regulations. And um, they had a very public meeting where um, they lined up all this hospital management, like dozens and dozens of them all to sing the praises of the current administration. And it was just, you know, a handful of union members, many of them like on a day off or like trying to get a break during work, listening through all this comment that was like, the CEO is great. I had lunch with him yesterday. You know, like uh, I'm, a, you know, not exaggerating here. I'm the parking lot contractor. Like uh, I think the CEO is great. And, you know, I'm the, I supply the linens, my people, you know, like I, I hire 50 employees who supply the linens. And I think the administration is great. It was like that kind of stuff. They overplayed their hand so much um, that you know became obvious to everyone listening and the county supervisors. Like, geez, um, you know we've got to do something. Uh, and the strike basically pushed them to have to take public action in this really dramatic meeting. Um, so that I think members felt, and then also um, seeing all these executives resign one after the other or get fired um, has made a big difference. The actual conditions of people's work hasn't changed that much. And that's, I think, you know, where it's really painful to, to, to watch and to have to be patient and wait for bargaining to be done. The tone and tenor of bargaining has completely and utterly changed, right? So before the strike, we went from complete standstill for basically a year of bargaining, um, you know, kind of like management saying, we want to rewrite, we're planning, we're going to rewrite a bunch of your contract. They're even declaring things like we're going to start charging you in January for health insurance. You know, we're not even bargaining about that. We're just going to do it. Um, all kinds of wild stuff. Uh, we, we went from that 
to we had the strike and all of a sudden they got rid of their bargaining team, replaced them with different people who have this long-standing reputation in the county for making labor peace. Um, and so now it's kind of like, you know, we're, we're talking to a very kindly uh, grandfather who's in his 80s, who like what really wants to know what we care about and we're rapidly settling all of our issues. They're dropping their takeaways rapidly and we're down to probably like our last dozen um, proposals. So we're coming to a close, um, but it's frustrating that it hasn't fully happened. Yeah, I know that felt really frustrating for us during the strike when we were still hearing um, the asinine requests of our administration sometimes. Um, but I know that that's gotta be feel so vindicating that they have completely switched around their um, negotiating members and um, have finally started to uh, listen to your needs. So I hope you guys are, you know, get everything you want and don't let them sneak anything in. Yeah, and I, I think it's really worth repeating to our coworkers that, you know, like what we all did, right? Like what 3,000 of us or 6,000 in your case did is not anything that really any other person or group could have accomplished. Like there's no, there's no way that here in Northern California, there's some politician who was about to like do all this, right? There's no way. And there's, there's just nobody else that would have done this except for all of us that work there. Um, and we literally accomplished it. Like we have, now we have uh, nurses on the board of trustees that runs a hospital that are our union members. Like that's crazy. We didn't have anybody like that before. It's, we need it's that. a big transformation. This is great. You all ask the good questions. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, with an eye to time and just wanting to sort of bring us to a to a close out and wrapping up, I wanted to to ask for both of you, like, what are the the biggest challenges and promises that you see ahead um, where you work? You've both mentioned in, in some of these things, um, but if you could summarize some of your thoughts about, you know, over the next six months to a year, both directly where you work and maybe more broadly, if you'd like, uh, things that you're concerned about within healthcare. Uh, what are the things that you're paying attention to, feeling optimistic about, or think that we're going to have to fight about? Um, I mean, I definitely think that in our immediate future, um, you know, it's um, unions who are going to be standing up for the everyday person. Um, and, you know, without, you know, setting the example of, um, you know, like joining forces, um, fighting, you know, the guy upstairs or whatever, and, um, and really just speaking up for um, the underdogs, it, you know, like that's a constant need and we can never not be doing that. Like it needs to be all the time. Um, even when you're tired, even when you need a nap, even when um, you have a headache, like that's, you know, even when you're tired of hearing yourself talk about union action and, uh, and participating in, um, you know, like fighting for what's fair for everybody. Um, like you just have to constantly do it and just be so dedicated. And, um, you know, like if, if one person sees that you're not giving up, then maybe they won't either. And so um, might make them feel like they can um, be the union loudmouth that they need to be, um, you know, and just expen exponentially uh, everyone can do that together um, or support each other when, when they're too tired and pick up the, the torch and, and keep going with what someone else was doing. Um, at our hospital immediately, like definitely we always have to keep an eye on the administration that we're working with. Um, and um, that's through like, um, we have a process where we fill out uh, forms like uh, assignment despite objection to um, document inappropriate and unsafe um, happenings on the units um, and uh, filing grievances. Um, you know, every member is, is encouraged to like actually read the contract, know what is in the contract um, so that when there are violations, they can be documented and um, and fought against all the time. Um, so, the, you know, our union is great about educating us on uh, what to do when there are um, contract violations and 
how to proceed with them. And then they fight like bulldogs to against those things and file the grievances um, and they win all the time. So um, even though it's like a slow process or an arduous process, like they just keep going. And so if the membership does that too, then, um, you know, like there's the worst they can say is no and nothing will change. And then you're just in the same place. Um, but the best that can happen is that everything can totally turn around. Um, as far as like in the future and more broadly, like, gosh, once they start getting these vaccines out, won't it be so nice? Like now that we have an administrator at the very top who's like, yeah, I believe in this. Um, you know, just uh, even uh, my roommate who you may have seen passing back and forth is a um, grocery store worker and she um, has been trying and trying and trying to get an appointment for the vaccine and even looking at driving hours away to try to get one, um, finally was able to schedule hers um, sometime later this month. So, you know, like that, that safety of, of people being vaccinated and, um, and people who are in charge listening to science and following safety protocols is going to be a huge thing. And then it just opens up the door for more union action because it'll be safe to do it again. Um, and so like there's the sky's the limit while well, we have the person we have. So like, we gotta just keep going and do everything as much as possible. <laughs> cool, um, I, can, I can answer that too. I think uh, like in the workplace, um, what we have to look forward to is, is that we now have, you know, almost every single coworker has gone through this experience of going on strike. And so a lot of the fears that people had that we had to address um, beforehand um, you know, uh, we, we learned effective ways to do that. Uh, but a lot of the fears that they have have basically melted away and disappeared, right? We had like, you know, people going around just basically saying the sky is falling. Uh, if you go on strike, we're all getting fired, that sort of thing. Um, and we had to remind people like, hey, the, that benefits the boss if we all go around saying that. And of course they want us saying that, right? And it's just not true. Um, and now everybody's got the experience. We all did it, nobody got fired. Um, and we made a huge change that no one else could have made. Um, so that's something that we have to look forward to. Uh, what we have to guard against and be you know, wary of, um, and we see little bits of, is people falling back into the same patterns from before the strike, where they think the union is like this outside entity, like an insurance company um, that you pay to take care of your problems, which is just not true or realistic. Um, and, uh, you know, and that they don't have any, any role to play in fixing problems in their own workplace or fixing things for patients or for themselves and their coworkers. And that, I think that's part of what we have to guard against. Um, but now we have this, you know, crop of people that kind of popped up during the strike that we saw organizing their coworkers, bringing people out to the picket line or doing um, interesting things to get people together. Like, you know, there are a couple of people I can think of who we're always the one holding the dance party down on the corner all day, right? And they got pe other people to participate. Those are people now we need to be thinking about like, hey, you know, should we um, see if they're interested in a leadership role or being a steward? And how can we mentor them and encourage that? Um, are there, you know, are there whole departments that have been kind of missing in all this that we can now bring in? Um, one of the things I think that was a real big learning experience for us too is people that cross the picket line, like how do we approach them? Um, do we uh, shame them and ostracize them, or do we see them as potential uh, people to join us next time if we have to do it again? Um, and I think all that's been a growing experience for us. Kind of on the macro level, I'd say that, um, you know, industry-wide, what's going on is that in the public and private sectors, budgets are being cut, which is really crazy because if you think in terms of, like, just on a human level, what's happening is millions of people are dying and we're cutting healthcare budgets. And that makes no sense. That means less healthcare workers, less capacity to respond to millions of people dying. And so, um, you know, that's something that we're gonna have an uphill battle to fight um, because we're fighting, you know, huge amounts of money and power that we don't all have. But at the same time, I think the potential for us to fight back is much bigger because the, there's, I think, better public understanding of the need for healthcare. Um, I think it's closer to most people's kind of like, hearts and heads and wallets and maybe families and friends that they know that have died or been sick with COVID, um, that if we're having a fight about, you know, like um, hire more 
nurses or surgical techs or medical clerks, uh, people can understand maybe, oh, yeah, I remember like, you know, grandma had to wait a long time because there weren't enough nurses. Um, so I, I think that, you know, it's kind of like, um, it's both good and bad for us that, uh, that this is happening, like as far as our potential to organize um, and get the public on our side. Thank you both for your insights on that. I think that's uh, very helpful. And also, uh, you know, I think it's important to be level-headed about the challenges ahead of us, but also about the terrain on which we're fighting and that uh, fights help us fight better the next time and be stronger for the next ones. Um, so I really just want to extend my, like uh, the uh, real depth of gratitude to both of you to coming out and talking tonight because I think it's been really amazing and I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, a third panelist was unable to join us tonight, uh, Michelle from Nisna, uh, because she wasn't feeling well, not COVID related, just uh, wasn't feeling up to it. Um, but uh, conversations like these, I think, are so important, and uh, making connections like these are so important. Just a, a couple quick plugs. I'm in a follow up email to everybody who registered to this. I'm going to send, uh, we have some labor notes articles about these particular struggles that I want to share if you want to keep doing reading about it. Um, plugging also that the labor notes website is a really great resource, I think, for. Uh, learning more about other things that are going on in the labor movement, but also finding organizing resources. Our books cover a lot of the type of stuff that we're talking about, about building community support, about uh, shop floor level organizing that I'm sure uh, many of you who are attending this are already familiar with, but always worth uh, giving it a second look. And also, uh, you know, if you're interested in continuing to think about these questions about um, organizing and uh, building connections uh, on organizing in healthcare. Um, we'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, my email, which I will send in the follow up email, is very simple. It is joe at labornotes.org. And I'm, we're always trying to think about how to deepen connections between uh, unionists in uh, different union locals across. Uh, across industries, but also within industries. So uh, reach out. We want to know what, what fights you're up to. We want to know what's going on with you. We want to know how we can help and connect you to other people who have thought about similar questions. So uh, this has been fantastic. It's been a great way for me to spend my Friday evening personally, and I hope that you all have felt the same. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all at future ones. Um, really, again, uh, John and Kristen just like, so great talking with you and having you out and it's uh it's really inspiring to to be able to to hear from you about this pleasure to be here and an honor to speak uh after kristen uh, and all the inspiration that that uh, her strike gave our members solidarity y'all thanks for saying that john thank you all for listening and um you know like your support and solidarity um could you know um, be the one thing that somebody else in a union who's struggling needs to just keep fighting. So um, like, I really feel inspired by you, John, and what you guys are going through and from listening to my other um, compatriots who are also um, union members across the country and hearing about what they're doing also inspired me and, and gave me strength at, at the time that we were fighting. So thank you so much. And I was really um, honored to be asked to speak. Thank you. A beautiful ending. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Have a great night, weekend. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Solidarity.